I mean, is anybody even still going to be looking for our videos on you? Oh, hey, it's you. Oh, I'm so happy you're here. You were always one of my favorites. You may have noticed that Mr. Foreman and I have not been too active on the YouTube front lately. Between a global pandemic, wildfires, and a myriad of other issues, we've been a little bit more homebound than we would have liked. But here we are, we're back with this video for you, and in the coming days, we're heading out to film even more adventures. While watching this, you might notice the glaring absence of our most beloved expedition member. Well, this was filmed back in 2015, but we've only just recently got around to editing it. So rest assured, Cricket is fine. This just all happened before she graced the world with her glorious presence. So sit back, relax, and let us take you to Yellowstone. Enjoy, and we'll see you real soon. Ish. We are off on a road trip. Unfortunately, we've had to leave the disco behind as it's yet to prove any semblance of reliability. Our main objectives for this road trip are the Grand Tetons and Yellowstone National Parks. Now, it's going to take us two hard days of driving just to get to our first stop. And if all goes to plan and we make it home, we'll have visited seven U.S. states. Leaving our home in Northern California, our travels take us over the Sierras and down into the vast open plains of Nevada, where the highway snakes its way out beyond the horizon. We soak in the sights and enjoy the open road experience, whether we be the passenger or the driver. Along the way, we find ourselves in the dead center of Winnemucca, a small town granted the seal of approval from a number of prestigious fast food outlets. After a long drive and the sun sinking low, we stop at a small diner for dinner, drinks, and perhaps some gambling before proceeding off the highway for the night's rest in a tent. Back on the highway, we endure a terribly toxic coffee from the McDonald's in Elko. At Wells, we turn north towards Idaho. Periodically along the road, we come across these things that look like overpasses, but that's not what they are. They're actually migration corridors for species like the pronghorn antelope, so they don't have to cross the busy highway. As a secondary measure of protection, these fences help funnel the animals off the road and back out into the wilds. Twin Falls is situated on the banks of the beautiful Snake River. As promised, we see at least two waterfalls cascading into the river below from the impressive bridge that spans the canyon. But no snakes. As we marvel at the panoramic splendor, a commotion erupts as a man is about to jump off the bridge. Don't do it, you stupid bastard! Before the silly bastard has even hit the ground, another chap jumps from the bridge. Then another! It isn't a legal maneuver, so they have to make a hasty exit. We're in the great state of Wyoming and about to sink into a great depression called Jackson Hole. How far have we got to go to Jackson? Nine minutes. Oh, is that all? Yep, we're almost there. By the time we arrive at our hotel, things have become a little damp. Living in the drought-stricken state of California, I'd almost forgotten what this stuff was. In a month or two, there'll be a presidential election. I wonder who will win. This arch of elk antlers is not necessarily as macabre as it may appear, as these large beasts shed their antlers yearly. 
In stark contrast to this is a little tourist shop up the road full of formerly living creatures, all of which would have never imagined they'd end up on display paddling canoes. There's even a little squirrel with a little gun. You probably wish he had that the day he died. This one's more my style. Oh, that's definitely snow up there on the hills. Yeah. Oh, that's one of the Tetons. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Moose crossing next one mile. Good. Like moose. Up the valley from Jackson Hole is a spectacular national park that, as one will see, is very popular. Here we are overlooking the Grand Tetons National Park, which obviously is a French word. And you don't have to be as skilled as I in the French language to know that it means big mountains. No, it doesn't. It means big tits. We're here on the Snake River in Wyoming and I'm going to try fishing for some trout or whatever I can catch. I've got my poor man's waders on. Oh, I stuffed that up. You suck! You're embarrassing yourself. This Magansa tries to pretend not seeing my failed effort as he paddles on by. Redemption! A fish is captured. There we go, at least my fishing license has been justified. <laughs> I said it's definitely not the most handsome fish out there. Yeah, a little like the angler. Anyway, I'll put him back in the water. I don't think he'll be going to the pot. It seems only fair to give the fly rod a bit of a try out, wading out to a likely strike zone. For me, success is rare, even on a good day, and at least for fly fishing, this day is not. Later in the year, the weather cools and winter threatens to unsheath her icy claws. The leaves of the trees begin to die off and create a dazzling array of bright colors that seem to glow in the rays of sunlight. The mirror finish on the water reflects the spectacular scenery that the park has to offer. The fall is also the rut for cervids such as elk. The males spend the summer growing their formidable antlers, used in combat to secure breeding rights from other males. These burly beasts bellow frequently this time of year in the hopes to intimidate rivals and impress the ladies. As the day wears on, the weather takes a turn for the worse. Rain showers appear in the distance, promising a damp night at camp. Oh, it's a little stormy. Ow. Ooh. You gonna tell us what we're doing? Where we are? Uh, yeah. Where are we? Signal, signal Mountain? I think so. Yeah. Well, it's our first night in the Grand Tetons and um, things are a little bit wet. But uh, it could be worse. We have a rickety contraption to keep the rain off us. And we got dinner cooking. I think we're doing alright. Yeah, and there's whiskey so it all will be well. <laughs> whiskey. 
Oh, things are boiling vigorously. Time for a simmer. Getting close. What are we having? Chicken. Yep. Corn spuds and chicken. And Brussels. Brussels. That's what's happening tonight. I think we're done. Oh, that's a nice river. <gasps> that looks very fishy. That looks very fishy. I'm sure it is. There's a bat in the cave. Oh. Welcome Hi. to Yellowstone. How are Thank you today? You. Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing pretty good myself. Thank you for asking. That's me. Have a lovely day. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So that pass is... So how many of the pass cost 60 bucks? 80 bucks. Oh, 80 bucks. Yeah. And entry to the park was 50? I think so. So the two parks was fifty. For the 50? two parks, yeah. Hey. Oh, think safety, act safely. It's a dangerous place. I'll well, keep ninety-one meters back from bears and wolves, and twenty-three meters from all other animals. You would be surprised. Ice and bears and elk have injured and killed people. Mm -hmm. well, fishing. Lake Lewis will be our first base camp for the next chapter in this excursion. Each and every campsite has one of these big metal boxes. These are bear boxes and they're essential because bears are opportunistic omnivores. They'll eat just about anything. That makes campsites particularly vulnerable. So, all of our food, all of our water containers, even our cosmetics, soaps and toiletries have to go in here. Anything that smells potentially yummy is in trouble. So on this visit to Yellowstone National Park, it's gonna be more of an overview. We're gonna to go to all the really popular spots that all the tourists usually go to. So it's gonna seem crowded, but if we were to go just a mile off the road in any direction, we'd probably find ourselves mostly alone. 90% of the visitors never go that far, and only 1% actually get into the backcountry. So we'll save that for a future episode. finding ourselves at a very active geothermal location with a beautiful view over Duck Lake. I haven't seen any ducks. We do see a raven however, which is always a bonus. Not far below the surface of Yellowstone is a gargantuan furnace of molten magma called a hotspot that fuels the multitudes of geothermal attractions within the park, more than all the rest of the worlds combined. Much of the region is within a massive caldera that was once a volcano that blew its guts out around 600,000 years ago, doing quite a bit of damage as one might expect.
Whether it's called Duck Lake or the West Thumb, it's really part of the Greater Yellowstone Lake, a vast puddle of water that is quite intriguing giving rise to thoughts of canoe adventures out there on that glassy surface. Flowing north from Lake Yellowstone, the river plunges over the park's largest waterfall and into what's called the Yellowstone Grand Canyon. The falls are a major attraction and on the opposite bank, a steep stairway leads down to a lookout. Back in the 1900s, a fellow by the name of Uncle Tom Richardson guided people down this formidable descent with steps and rope ladders. Nowadays it's a more civilised version of steel staircases taking the traveller three quarters of the way into the canyon to gaze out over the spectacular lower falls. Gee whiz, this car park's bigger than a Walmart. <laughs> well, I, I can tell you which one I'd rather go to. The billowing plume of steam from that off-white mound is what we are here to see. The park's rangers have a knack for predicting the geyser eruptions to within 10 minutes most of the time, and as the crowds gather, that time is approaching. Anyone experiencing feelings of loneliness and isolation will find a cure here. The performance begins as jets of water and steam erupt from beneath the earth that acts like a pressure cooker until the centre seal is obliterated and the superheated water is blasted to the surface. The crowds go wild. Much of this water started out as rain or snow melt that has spent hundreds of years percolating through the soil to replenish the geyser's reservoirs. It has indeed gotten a trifle frosty. My esteemed companion, Mr. Ganley, bought me this very stylish woolly hat for a wedding gift. Very stylish like me. Which one? Where's the one? Yes. Oh, it is in moderation. Kind of, yeah, I think it is. I think it might be done. Yeah. Well, one of them's falling apart. Mine. <laughs> <laughs> so very unprofessional. Normally that would be, oh shit, sorry, that's yours. Somewhere higher up on the wildlife highlights is a great grey owl. A creature that creates quite a stir with the public. These large owls are mainly found in central Alaska and across Canada, with a limited range in the US, mainly in the northern Rockies, and a few small populations scattered about elsewhere. We're observing a rather large owl here from the side of the road and seeing some very poor form on behalf of fellow tourists that are creeping in closer and closer. This animal's trying to hunt, and for the sake of a photograph, they're likely going to scare it off. Chocker Block Car Park signifies yet another attraction. This walkway carries the tourist out over hostile territory to the main attraction, the Grand Prismatic Spring. Its impressive colours are from living organisms called thermophiles that seem quite happy living in extremely toxic environments. Other factors affecting the colours found in these hot springs is water temperature and mineral content.
streams here in Yellowstone are world famous for fly fishing and for good reason. They're full of fish, the scenery is magnificent, and the serenity of the bush. Now, I think the fish here are very savvy to all the dirty tricks of the angler. So that is where I am going to play the wild card. Because I think that if I don't know what I'm doing, nor will the fish, and that will give me the edge. I don't know how they're resisting. Right. I don't know. What's happened? It's broke off. Give me West Australian wharf fishing for blowies any day. Farther north is the winding valley of the Madison River that flows west beyond park boundaries. Here one finds those iconic images of fly fishermen hunting the elusive trout in the company of elk and bison. And not to forget ducks. Following the Grand Loop Road to the north of the park is the Mammoth Resort. But it's not just humans who inhabit this village. The lush green grass and pleasant surroundings attract a herd of resident elk that have called the resort home for generations. So far, the best wildlife viewing we've had in the park is at one of the villages, right here on the lawn. The grass is not only attractive to those above, but also to those below. Here, an industrious gopher excavates a burrow. On the outskirts of the village is the Mammoth Hot Springs. Its white terraces were created by mineral deposits from the hot water bubbling up deep within the earth. Almost shot to extinction back in the late 1800s, with very few left in Yellowstone, a recovery program was instigated with the assistance of some other surviving bison from elsewhere in the country. The efforts were an outstanding success, and now North America's largest land-dwelling mammals have managed to rebound to good numbers within the park. There's a bit of a holdup because the, uh, the bison had to cross the road, and unfortunately, some people don't really respect the fact that, you know, a lot of cars will freak them out and impede their natural habits, so the rangers have had to come and shut down part of the road so the bison can cross, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> there's, a, there's a few bison behind us as well that have just kind of integrated in with the traffic. <laughs> They're all jammed up as well. Wildlife spotting in Yellowstone National Park is surprisingly easy. You just look for the enormous amount of vehicles parked up on the side of the road. Kind of like up ahead here. That'd be it. This traffic jam is in response to a couple of bighorn sheep grazing alongside the road. In the U.S., white-tailed deer are the most widespread of deer species, but scarce in Yellowstone. Here, the western species of mule deer, such as these, are far more common. This spectacular specimen is lucky not to have his head on the wall of a Bass Pro Shop. The antelope-like pronghorn is another common sight, though the elk are the most populous mammals of the park. The largest member of the deer family in North America is the moose. They're not in great abundance in the Yellowstone ecosystem, so not the most common sighting. Large males can weigh up to a thousand pounds and during the rut possess spectacular antlers, none of which are on display among these specimens. In fact, these may well be females. A coyote marks her territory, a very important job in groundskeeping. The ever elusive wolf is an easier spot within the winter months. Grizzly bears are no doubt a major highlight to observe in the wild. 
these enormous omnivores can really show a trash can who's boss. But we shouldn't leave out some of the other residents, such as the dusky grouse or the lesser chipmunk. Our travels bring us into the scenic Lamar Valley, called by some the Serengeti of North America. Through it flows the Lamar River, and although the valley has a frosty appearance in the winter months, its relative lower elevation makes it more hospitable to wild community members than elsewhere in the park, attracting a large number of elk and bison. This makes it the premier place in Yellowstone for wolf spotting. Yellowstone National Park and we're taking the northeast gate out that's gonna put us into Cook City now ideally we'd like to camp but because our tent is soft-sided and this is grizzly country that's not allowed so instead we're gonna be staying at a lodge tonight then tomorrow we're gonna tackle the Beartooth Highway through the Absarokas it's said by some to be America's most scenic highway Cook City is a likeable little town with a bit of that Old West feel to it. Our night's accommodation is here at the Soda Butte Lodge. This road takes us into high elevations over rough and rocky country the domain of the mountain goat. Although these creatures are a US native, they are believed to be an introduced species around here. The Beartooth Highway re-enters the state of Wyoming, ascending higher into the mountains where we find a quirky little stall. Wilms like souvenir shops making stops a priority. From on top of the world, our journey continues through rugged terrain and eventually back into Montana, viewing spectacular valleys that signal our descent. Eventually, we find ourselves on the highway heading west towards Butte, where we find an agreeable spot to camp out in the bush beneath a jagged outcrop of granite decorated by pine trees. But out on the horizon, the atmosphere above shows signs of turbulence and malevolence. After a damp evening, we awaken to a pleasant day that calls for cheese and tomato jaffles to be cooked over the fire. It's pretty hot when it went on, so... Oh, shit. Can you give me a fork, please, Gav? Fork, please? Sorry. Preferably not one covered in coffee. We're not the only ones enjoying breakfast. Out in the forest, a small chipmunk has found something nourishing to nibble upon, and a cuckoo seems relieved to have survived last night's storm. And 
And so begins our long trip home with more great sunsets, wonderful campsites, and an unexpectedly rainy return to California. The end of yet another adventure. Well, you, you gonna sort out this roof or what? Looks like it's caved in a bit. 